Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back here with you this morning. Um, I just want to say before I get started, I, I really appreciate John and I were gone last week and um, went to California with Brother Jeff and um, appreciate everybody who was able to help out in my absence. Uh, appreciate Randy for preaching and then um, my cousin, I think, was here Sunday night, um, so I'm glad that he was able to fill in. I know he's been trying to preach a little bit more, and so appreciated the opportunity. So anytime somebody comes, especially from somewhere else, you know, give me some feedback on how they did. I haven't heard anything. I'm, I just now heard that he came. So um, I knew he was supposed to come, but I'm glad he showed up. And, uh, you know, let me know, because um, I, I remember there was a couple years back, somebody came, and, and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, please don't ever have them back again. And uh, so, if that's, the, if that's the case, just let me know. And uh, we, don't, we want to make sure you're getting edified. And um, <laughs> we don't want that situation. Um, but hopefully you did a good job. Look forward to hearing it on the, on the uh, website. Um, <clears throat> had a great trip. I don't ever want to be gone that long again. Samuel, I think, grew six inches um, <laughs> when we got back. He came down the steps this morning, and it looks like he's wearing capri pants. <laughs> I said, son, son, don't you have any, any other pants besides that? All the people are going to feel sorry for us. Um, so we need to go shopping maybe this afternoon for him. He's growing like a weed. Um, <clears throat> But uh, good to be back with them and the family. Uh, we came back, and Zoe doesn't talk to us very much. Um, but while we were gone, she called us about every hour, I think. <laughs> and we're like, what's wrong with this girl? She's constantly calling us and talking to us. So we need to leave more often so we have good conversations <laughs> with each other. Well, <clears throat> I, I want to continue. We've been talking about uh, seeking first the kingdom of God this year. We kind of took a break from it for a month or two there um, this summer. But I want to get back on to that theme a little bit with you this month. And I want to consider with you, especially when it comes to the kingdom, kingdom families. We want to think about the family on the next three lessons for, to finish out this month. And I want to start by considering with you the biblical portrait of a husband. We just had our pictures taken for the director. And so while we're thinking about portraits and pictures, and I want to thank everybody who helped with that too, Courtney, uh, Rhiannon, Jim Gregg was sitting there quite a bit this weekend, I know. I think Iris pitched in and sat there for a while. So everybody who helped out with that, appreciate it. Um, and um, it's, a, it's just a helpful tool to have one of those. So you can, especially for new members, learn the names of people. I remember when I first moved here, uh, it took quite, you know, quite a while to learn everybody's names. Uh, and I'm sure anybody who's moving here or becoming a, a member here, to learn the names, it's helpful to have that directory. So appreciate everybody for cooperating and helping um, in getting your picture taken so we can use that tool. Um, <clears throat> I want to think about with you the biblical portrait of a husband. Marriage is not an institution that's created and designed by man. It's not created and designed by the state. It may be altered by the state, which it has been, but it wasn't created and designed by the state. And because it is a God-ordained institution, it is not subject to alteration by societal whims. Rather, marriage is a sacred institution. Um, of the three institutions of God, God has ordained the home, God has ordained the nation, God has ordained uh, the church. But of the three institutions regulated and ordained by God, the home is the oldest. You read about it in Genesis chapter 2, just after the creation of of the world and then the creation of man, you finally see God noticing that man is alone and needs a helper. And in verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And then you find in verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. He took one of his ribs, he closed up the flesh in its place. 
And then the rib in which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And here in verse 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Man and woman, husband and wife, becoming one flesh. And at that point, Adam and Eve were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. We read in Genesis 2. This is the oldest institution of God, and it's regulated, ordained by God, but regulated by Jesus and His apostles in the Word of God. And it's reserved. Marriage bond is reserved for sexual intimacy between a man and a woman. Now, marriage is under attack in our nation, in our culture today. But I want to make the argument with you that marriage is a successful institution. Now, the argument that's being made by our culture is, well, look, half of marriages are ending in divorce. It seems like a lot of married people aren't very happy. Not many of the marriages we see today this might not seem successful, and here's why. Because they're not God-ordained marriages. The husband and the wife aren't working together as a team built upon God's rules and principles as they go about their marriage business. And when that happens, marriage is a miserable thing. Marriage is only going to be successful when the God who ordained it is the God who is sustaining it. And when we're both following God's principles. Marriages today are, are broken because they become godless covenants. Contracts that have been made by so many people without the guidance of God's will. Now, when we follow the biblical injunctions concerning marriage, and when members of the family fulfill their proper roles in marriage, marriage is a successful institution. Preventing marriage and family from becoming an emotional and psychological straitjacket when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, it prevents us from becoming the proverbial ball and chain and prevents us from the source of much strife and hurt in our life when husband and wife are both working together following God at the top. Well, what are those biblical injunctions? That's what we want to think about here today concerning the proper roles of the members of the family. Today we're going to focus on the husbands. Next week we'll think about the wives, and after that we're going to think about our roles as parents. And because we're thinking about our roles as parents, we'll think about what our roles as children are as well in that third lesson. But as we examine the scriptures, I think what we're going to find is that God has revealed an inspired portrait to how each individual family member should function, what they ought to look like. So I want to first consider the duties of husbands. Let's think about husbands, and I just want to think about this key text with you. As we consider the roles of husbands, we're going to look at just three very basic things that husbands need to do if marriage is going to be successful. The first one is this. Love your wives. Let's read it. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives. Let's make sure we put the emphasis on that. Why have a lot of marriages gone astray? Because husbands are falling in love and showing their love and affection and care and concern for someone besides their wife. Very simple here. Maybe we overlook that very simple point of the verse. Husbands love your wives. Your wife. Not anybody else's wife. Not any other woman. Love your wife. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church." first point that we might learn as we consider husbands loving their wives is we're to love our wives and there's a principle here as Christ loved the church. Uh, this is a simile. Similes use the words like or as. It's a term of comparison. If you want to know how to best love your wife then you need to understand how Christ loved the church. 
And that's why I say a lot of marriages aren't going to be successful when there are men who don't know a, a, a blip about Jesus Christ. They don't know Christ. You don't know how to love your wife if you're not truly in a, in a, in a proper relationship with Him. You can't wrap your head around that. Well, how did Christ love the church? Well, what does it say? It says He gave Himself up for her. So the first thing that we learn in Christ's love for the church is that sacrifice was involved, self-sacrifice. When you get married, if you're going to properly love your spouse, then there's going to have to be some sacrifices that take place. Sacrifice is going to be involved. I have people that have asked me since I've gotten married and moved here, you know, back before I was married, I used to, I did some musicals back home and performed. Well, that requires having rehearsals every night, uh, performing on the weekends. Um, I've turned down those opportunities to do things like that um, since I've gotten married. Why? Because I've got a wife and I need to spend some time with her at night. People have asked me, do you want to be on this softball team, Josh? Well, that requires that I be, you know, practice once a week, then I go to a game another night a week. I'm busy enough. No. I used to play baseball. I used to enjoy sports. But there's some things that I don't do now because I need to give more time and attention uh, to my wife. And now that I have children, to my children as well. And so the things that I do try to involve myself in are things that usually involve my children when it comes to the extra stuff. The sacrifice is involved. And when we read that Jesus gave himself for the church, he sacrificed himself. How? He left heaven, the glories of heaven. He was enjoying, I'm sure, heaven and the purity and the innocence and the power that existed in heaven. He left that to come to earth. He sacrificed himself, went to the cross, died. Sacrifice is involved in loving your spouse. Just as sacrifice was involved in Jesus coming to this earth. Second principle. It says that he gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word, so that he might present the church to himself. It goes on in verse 29. Let's skip down there. No one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it. So love and loving the church involves sacrifice. Second thing that involves nourish and cherishing involves work. Anything that you nourish and cherish takes time, takes money, takes effort to nourish and cherish it. You nourish and cherish the Colts. <laughs> and there are people, there are people, the Colts, the Colts start playing today, right? Some of you are probably all chomping at the bit to go watch the Colts game. There are people who nourish and cherish their relationship with the Colts so much that they, they're going to spend the entire day in a parking lot eating hot dogs with their buddies. That takes time. That takes money. That takes effort to get all that stuff together so you can tailgate all day long. I say get a life. But, <laughs> but that's all right. They, they enjoy that. Whatever. Anything you nourish and cherish. You nourish and cherish a car. You got some car that you love. I know, I know one guy down in Indy that I grew up with. He spent more money on the speakers in his car than his car was worth. But he loved that car. And he spent money on that car. He spent time putting the speakers into the car. He spent time fixing the car up to make it borderline idolatry, really. But he nourished and he cherished it. Isn't it sad that there are some men who nourish and cherish their, their golf game, their car, their relationship with the Colts more than they do their own spouse? And you think to yourself, if you just put as much time and money and effort into your spouse as you put into your hobbies, what a great relationship you'd have in your marriage. Nourish and cherish. Jesus sacrificed himself for the church, and he spent all of his time, all of his effort when he was here on earth, giving himself for the sake of the church, to nourish and cherish it. That's, husbands, if you want to have a good relationship with your wife, there's the basic principles. He says you should nourish and cherish them, and here he gives another example as to, to what extent. He says in the same way that you love your own bodies, in the same way that you nourish and cherish your own bodies, you eat three times a day, right? Okay? 
Talk to your wife three times a day. Talk to her, encourage her. Okay? Take a shower every day. You feed yourself. Maybe you exercise every day. And yet there are, there are husbands who literally might go a day without even talking to their spouse. And they get up in the morning. Maybe their spouse is already up. Maybe their spouse is still in bed. They go to work. They work all day. Don't talk to their spouse. They get home. They eat. They turn on the tube. They go back to bed. Don't hardly say a word. You're not nourishing and cherishing your spouse. If that's the type of relationship you have with your spouse. It involves conversation. It involves um, talking. It involves feeding one another. It involves spending time with one another physically. Nourishing and cherishing. Handling those things with care. Notice another principle. This is in Colossians. It, it's not going to be up on your screen, but I wanted to notice it. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 19. Colossians 3 and verse 19. Verse 19 says this, Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. You think Paul ever dealt with the marriage issues in the churches that he worked with? I have to say that he did. I know that he did in Corinth. There were some big marriage issues going on there. But perhaps it's his background with dealing with some of these marriage issues that caused him to say what he does because he realizes what a temptation it is to be bitter towards your wife. Anytime you merge your life together with another personality, conflict is going to arise. Unless you're just that perfect, seamless couple. Which doesn't happen often. But you've got two, two personalities. They're merging. I want you to think about it this way. When, when, when I was 18, I, I moved out. And my parents had a house just kind of in their backyard, really. And so I moved in there. And I lived there with about four or five different roommates while I was in college. I must not have been a good roommate because I think I had a new one every year. I was probably the problem. But my, I lived with my twin brother, Dave. Let me tell you about Dave. Okay? And I'm just, I'm saying all this. I love Dave. Dave's a great guy. Um, Dave would get home and he, his job when he was in college was he, he worked fertilization. So you know, he's spraying those little yellow pellets all over the place. And um, he would have all that yellow dust and stuff all over his body, which is not good for you, which he quit doing, because um, it's not good for you. But <clears throat> he would come home, and he'd be working all day, he'd be sweaty, he's hot. He'd lay down on the floor on the carpet. After a couple months, and it drove me nuts because I'd get home and, Here's Dave laying out on the carpet, sweaty, dirty. I'm like, could you just take a shower? But Dave's laid out. After a couple months, there was a yellow stain on our carpet. It, it looked like someone had died, and they'd outlined his body in the same spot he laid every day. Anytime you put two people together, you're going to have some conflicts like that. I wanted Dave to take a shower a little more often and uh, not lay on the carpet and get it dirty. Dave wanted to relax when he got home. Okay. I had another roommate. His name was Mike. And Mike was a good guy. Mike had lupus when he moved in um, with me, and he struggled with that. He had to move out because he actually was in the hospital for a couple of months because he went down, downhill with his lupus. But he's doing well now. Um, Mike was a pretty nice guy, but Mike was a late nighter. And I, I didn't like to stay up that late. Um, I kind of had to be at school in the morning and uh, a lot of times I had classes at 8 or 9 and I wanted to get to bed so that I could get to school and so I could study and I, if I stayed up late it's because I was working on something usually. Mike was a late nighter though and outside my door Mike could be talking to his friends, he'd have his friends over, it was loud, it was obnoxious. Guy, but you know what? Anytime you put two people together in the same house you can have issues. I had another roommate. Uh, this, this, this room is a slob and he will remain nameless for that reason. <laughs> But I'm talking like underwear just strewn across the house. Okay? Now tell me something. I, I'm giving illustrations to my roommates. Do, do, do any of you women have these problems with your husbands? You know, sweat stains <laughs> on the couch or the floor or um, dirty clothes thrown all over the house in places that you wish they were not. Waking you up at night when you've got to work in the morning. 
don't raise your hands because I know some of you deal with that. Anytime you put two personalities together, you're going to have those same types of problems. I lived also with my grandma and with my sister, but I can pick on my brother, but I'm not going to pick on my grandma or my sister. So we'll just leave that silent. Now what happens when you live with somebody who has those types of habits? Well, you're tempted to be bitter, right? And you let it fester, and you start to really not like them, and it really doesn't bother you at some point when they move out. Well, you can't do that with your spouse. Colossians 3 and verse 19, Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. They're going to have different habits than you have, and I think we could reverse that just as easily and say, Wives, don't be bitter towards your husbands. <laughs> You need to learn to work together through some of those problems. Bitterness seeps in because we're resentful or because we start to have our hearts filled with hate. Bitterness is a term that is used in Ephesians chapter 4 and it's coupled with some other things. And maybe this is how our bitterness comes out. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 31 and 32. Verse 31 says, let all bitterness, and then it says, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Because we are bitter at times, we start to express our wrath and our anger. We loudly start to yell. Maybe we start to talk bad about somebody that we're married to, and we speak evil of them. Paul says, love your wives and don't be bitter towards them. In other words, don't let the effects of bitterness seep into your marriage. In your relationship. Husbands are to love your wives. So these are some of the things that we need to do if we love them. Now, what type of love is that? Well, if we read the scriptures, one of the fine things that we'll find is that um, it's agape love. Ephesians 5.25 where it says, Husbands, love your wives. That's the word agape. It's the word agape. That's what's commanded. It's defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Verse 4 says, Love suffers long as kind. What is agape love? In other words, that active goodwill. Where I love you, even sometimes when you, know, you leave your dirty clothes on the floor and your sweat stains, and you wake me up late at night. What is, how, how do I have to love you even though you do these things? Well, I suffer long, and I'm still kind to you. When you start getting in your marriages into the situation where you've done me wrong and therefore I do not care what you think, I'm going to do you wrong because I want you to know how it feels. You're not acting with agape love anymore. <coughs> this Agape love does not allow that tit for tat, vengeful feeling to seep in. Love suffers long and is kind. You're still kind. Even though you feel like you may have been wronged. Love does not envy Love doesn't parade itself, isn't puffed up. Don't always have to tell them what you do. Love doesn't behave rudely. So that's where husbands, if you are the ones leaving the clothes all over the floor and waking them up at night, you need to consider whether you're acting with agape love. Love doesn't act rudely. Don't be rude in how you treat them. Love doesn't seek its own. Love isn't provoked, thinks no evil. It's not always suspicious. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. There are a lot of marriages where couples are doing sinful things together. That's not, that's not biblical love either. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. rejoices in the truth. Love wants to do the right thing. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So husbands that are love their lives with agape love, the same sort of love that we're to have towards God and towards all men. And we are supposed to love our wives with filio love. It's a different Greek word. It means that we treat our wives with a sentimental type of affection as you would have for your own body. Now when you look in Ephesians chapter 5, both of those words are used. Ephesians 5.25 uses the word agape. Husbands, love your wives as Christ of the church. Ephesians 5.29, uh, you start seeing the word um, filio. It's the idea in these passages. The idea of sentimentality and affection is implied. Same type of affection we would have for our children. We care for them. Same type of affection we ought to have for our wives. There's also another term, it's not used in Scripture, the term eros, but clearly there is the idea of 
sexuality involved in our marriage as well. And Ephesians 5.31 would imply that. A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. The idea there is certainly being one flesh and that we are working together as a team and as a unit, both physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Uh, but clearly, if you read 1 Corinthians 7, providing physical attention and affection due to the wife is part of a husband's responsibility. And a wife who is left without affection or tenderness or sexual intimacy, if she so desires it, is a woman uh, who will be unhappy in your marriage. And a husband is not fulfilling his role if he's not sharing in that part of the marriage with his wife. Husbands have a duty to love their wives in every way. So love your wives. We could spend a lot of time just on that particular point, but no, let's notice the second one here. Husbands need to respect their wives. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Let's look at what Peter says about it. Paul is the one who writes the, book of the letter to the Ephesians. Peter is writing in 1 Peter chapter 3. And it's beneficial for us to look at how different apostles phrase things differently. 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Here's the key passage we're going to read from. Just this one verse is packed with information. It says, Likewise, husbands... Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. <laughs> respect your wives. How do I do that? I respect my wife by how I treat her. Verse 7 says I need to live with my wife in an understanding way. Do you know what it takes to be understanding of your wife? Every once in a while, you've got to turn off that television and put down what you're doing and listen. To listen. So, to understand them, don't you have to kind of communicate? The idea of communication is implicit in this passage. Listen to your wives. Be considerate. I think the very simple idea, and here's maybe a simple way of saying it, learn what makes her tick and treat her accordingly. And that's going to be different for different women. Depends on who you're married to. Don't, don't, don't try to be understanding with your wife by doing for her what some other woman would like. No, understand your wife. What does she want? What does she need? And offer it to her. Be understanding. It says also in verse 7, showing honor to the woman. You need to be understanding of them, listen to them. And then he says, showing honor or with honor. How do I honor my wife? Here's some things that need to happen when you're doing that. You need to praise them. You need to praise them. Look at the book of Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 28. There's a virtuous woman in here, but the man recognizes that he's married to a virtuous woman. And it says her husband also praises her. You need to praise your wife for what she's doing. Most, most certainly, your, your, your wife, is, especially if she's a Christian and a godly woman, she's doing things for you and for your family that are honorable and worthy of praise. So speak up and praise. Is she raising your kids? Does she diaper and feed them? Does she put food on the table for you? Is she going out and working to try to help provide some income to the house? What is it that she's doing to help you? Is she cleaning that house? Is there, different wives are going to be better at different things, but praise them for what they're doing. It's part of showing honor. Respect your wife. How do I respect my wife? Well, I listen to her. I need to listen to her concerns, and, and, I, and I honor her. I want to also say this. That doesn't mean you're not going to have conflict. There's not, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be times in your marriage that there aren't moments where either one of you needs to offer a little bit of criticism or admonishment. Constructive criticism, of course. But I would also suggest to you, don't ever make that criticism public and air your dirty laundry. Don't ridicule her publicly. One of the worst things that I see is when you get on there on Facebook or social media, somebody black, it's... Maybe they don't miss mention them by name, but it's obvious they're trying to get at somebody. They're blasting somebody publicly. Don't air your dirty laundry publicly. 
You can praise as far and wide as you want to, but it's just going to make things worse when you don't keep things within and among each other. Treat them with understanding. Treat them with honor. Third thing that we see in this is as to the weaker vessel. It's not that your wife may actually be the weaker vessel. My wife can probably beat me up. Okay? It's, it's not always that. Yeah. She takes kickboxing and stuff like that. She can probably throw me a roundabout kick in the face if she wanted to. That's not necessarily the idea. Many wives are spiritually stronger too. Some are physically stronger, but treat her as a weaker vessel. And I think the idea of a vessel, a vessel in Scripture, especially you see that term used many times, a vessel is like a dish. Right? What do you do with the fine china in your house if you have, you know, fine china? Most, a lot of people put it in a cabinet. They display it. Um, they protect it from the elements. They don't just throw it out there um, on the table every single day. Maybe they use kind of that junk Tupperware, that, that cornyware that you can just you can throw across the house and that won't break. You protect it. Keep it secure. You, you take care of it. Treat her like china and not steel. I think it's the idea. Don't be like a bull running wildly in a china shop. Treat her like the weaker vessel. Um, that's part of respecting your wife. And we respect our wife, finally, by how you view them. How do you view your wife? I think you should ask yourself that question, husbands. How do you view her? You view her just kind of as a, as a tool? To kind of get things done around the house? She's the washing machine, and she's... She's the cook, and she's the, the house cleaner. She's just a piece of equipment to you. Is that how you view your wife? How do you view your wife? The doormat? There are people, have you heard of people who say that he treats his wife like a doormat? He walks all over her. God forbid that somebody be able to say that about a Christian husband. But you treat your wife like a doormat, and you just treat her like garbage. It's kind of the baby maker. I had to get married because I wanted to have babies. How do you treat your wife? Here's how you should view your wife. Peter says, she's a fellow heir, a fellow heir of the grace of life. She's your partner. She's your partner who's... Jesus Christ died for who you need to try to help get to heaven and who you should be trying to look to her so she can help you get to heaven. View your wife as a beloved sister in Christ who's worthy of respect with whom you want to spend your eternity with. That's how Peter says you should view your wife. As one who affects the efficacy of your prayers. If you don't treat her right, 1 Peter 3 and verse 7 wants to say, your prayers could be hindered. Your prayers could be hindered. How we treat others, you do notice in Scripture it has a bearing on our prayers. Look at a couple other passages. Mark 11 and verse 26. Mark 11 and verse 26, it says, If you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Whether or not you're willing to forgive others is going to have some effect upon your prayer. Look at Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 13. Here's a proverb which seems to imply that. I think that's an important principle to realize. Don't just think that you can just be abusive and mean and malicious towards your spouse and then just go to God in prayer and God's going to be okay. No. God wants you to treat your fellow man right. It says, Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. You run the risk that God's not going to listen to your prayers when you don't treat your fellow man with respect. Look at Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16 in the Old Testament. The prophet Malachi warned of this. He told the people of Israel who were mistreating their wives, who were divorcing. He says this in Malachi 2, verse 13. This is the second thing you do. He says, you cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he doesn't regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say... 
For what reason? For what? That is, why doesn't God receive our offering? For what reason? Why doesn't God regard our offering? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. Because the Lord's been watching the relationship you have with your spouse, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she's your companion, partner, heirs together of the grace of life. She is your companion. She is your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? Why one? Because God seeks godly offspring. And therefore, take heed to your spirit. Let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says he hates divorce. It covers your garment with violence. And therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. When you treat your wife like garbage, when you walk all over her, when you're rude and abusive towards her, he says you deal and cover your garment with violence. There's a possibility God's not going to hear your prayers. It's going to affect your prayers. So how do you view your spouse? You should be viewing them as someone who's you're trying to help get to heaven and who's trying to help you get to heaven. Heirs together of the grace of life. To our duties as husbands, we need to love and respect our wives. Well, let's add one more. One more, and that's to support your wife. Support your wife. Look at 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. Verse 75 is a chapter that's directed to Timothy that he's supposed to share with the church that he was working with in Ephesus at that time. The purpose of it is to, to give the church some type of guidance as to how they are to deal with, with widows who are in the church. Verse 75, verse 8, though, is a verse taken out of that context where Paul says to Timothy, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household. I think that would include your wife, wouldn't it? He is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. How do you support your wife? Well, the husband has a duty to provide for his family. Your job, husbands, is to provide for your family. It's the most <coughs> fundamental, basic job that you have is to provide. We may not as husbands always be able to provide all of the, the wants and the luxuries that we wish we could provide, but you at least need to be providing bare bones the basic needs of your family. Making sure that they're clothed, making sure they've got food. You, as husbands, need to be the one who is providing the financial backbone for those basic necessities and things. And that means you're going to have to work to do it. The husband has a duty to provide. Failure to do so. Notice what it is. It's not just, well, you know, he's kind of lazy. Yeah, he could work a little. No, it's you've denied faith in Jesus Christ. It's a fundamental necessity of a believer in Jesus Christ. Unbelievers. Unbelievers have that figured out. People who have never darkened the door of a church building. There are men out there who, who represent themselves with more honor and respect when they at least provide for their own spouse and their children than men who are claimed to be Christians and won't provide for their own kids. Even animals. Some animals figure that out. See March of the Penguins? I mean, even the penguins can figure that out, some of them. As Christians, think that we would understand the importance of providing for our own. A man shouldn't take a wife unless you're able and willing to support her financially. So do what you've got to do to support him financially. That doesn't mean, I want to add this, that doesn't mean the wife doesn't have the right to contribute to the financial support of the home. The virtuous woman contributed quite a bit to the support of the family. Proverbs chapter 31, when you read about this woman, and I simply say this because I, I, I run across some women who their goal is, you know, I just want the husband to do all of the work and I just want, I just want to stay at home all the time, 100%. I don't want to ever have to make a dime to help with the family. Well, that's not what the virtuous woman did. Why, why have we started to 
think that that's a better way than what the virtuous woman was doing. Virtuous woman was helping some in the financial load of her family. Look at Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 16. She considers a field. She buys it from her prophets. She plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength. She strengthens her arms. She perceives her merchandise is good. Her lamp doesn't go out by night. She's working at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hand holds the spindle. Verse 24. She makes linen garments. She sells them. She supplies sashes for the merchants. So she was providing some level of income to the family as well. Here's the thing that I definitely want to make sure that we point out, though. She wasn't providing all of it. And if you're making your spouse provide, your, your wife provide all the income to the family while you're not providing any and you're capable of doing so, then you're in sin. And you're living a sinful life and you ought to repent of that. You need to change that. There are too many men, and you see men all over the world today, you see moms who are working themselves to the bone, many of them, because there's, there's deadbeat dads, or they're even married to men who sit at home and, and play video games and play golf and mess around all day while, while their wives go out and do all the work. That's not the way the Christian home is supposed to function and operate. It's shameful if a home's operating like that. Now, when your wife contributes, what did this good husband do? He praises her. He also gives her credit for what she is doing and, and how she is helping provide. He praises her. So make sure if your wife is involved in helping with those things that you're giving her, the praise that she deserves. Important to note that wives, though you may be involved in that... We'll just jump on this now before waiting until next week while we're in Proverbs 31. We need to make sure that we're not involved in the neglect of our household responsibilities. Proverbs 31 and verse 21, there is a difference between the responsibilities given to a man and given to a wife. Proverbs 31 to verse 21 says she's not afraid of snow for her household. All her household is clothed with scarlet. She's not out there working and letting somebody else clothe her kids. She's involved with her family. It's implied in verse 21. Verse 27, she watches over the ways of her household. She doesn't get so busy in her career that she doesn't have time to pay attention to her own children. She watches over the ways of her household. She does not eat the bread of idleness. So she's paying attention to those familial duties. Duties not only mentioned there in Proverbs, but in Titus chapter 2, verse 4, young women ought to love their husbands, love their children, be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good and obedient to their husbands that the word of God may not be blasphemed. That's part of the responsibility of a wife. Take care of the home. Primary responsibility of taking care of the family in terms of financial provisions is given to the husband. Those are three things. Love your wife, respect your wife, support your wife. Three things. A Christian husband is a man who then loves his wife in every way respects his wife by how he treats her and how he views her. And thirdly, supports his wife financially, emotionally, and spiritually. She needs your support in all those ways. It's more than just putting food on the table, men. It's giving them spiritual support, emotional support when they need it to, providing for those things. The reason why a Christian husband does these things is because the Christian husband is a man who is a Christian first and a husband second. It's because he gladly accepts the biblical injunctions given to him as a husband. If he's a Christian, he gladly accepts, this is my responsibility, this is what God has given to me, this is what God instructs me to do, and I'm glad to do it. Because God knows what's best for my life if you're a truly God-fearing person. The Christian husband is a man who looks to the Word of God in prayer for the strength that he needs to fulfill his duty. And when a man is a Christian husband, he's more likely, listen, here's what's going to happen in your home, he's more likely loved and respected by his wife. You want the respect of your wife? Love her, respect her, and support her. And you will get some of that respect in return by a godly wife. She's more likely to be the sort of wife she should be, and the children, the children are more likely to be as they should be. You want your kids to grow up to be like you? I think that's a powerful argument too, isn't it?
they need. In our next lesson, we're going to think about the duties of wives. In the, in the meantime, I simply offer this as an invitation. Jesus Christ came to this earth, gave himself for the church. And if you're not a part of the church yet, you need to recognize what Jesus Christ did when he did that. He left his heavenly home, lived as a man, so that he could live a sinless life, so that he could become the perfect sacrifice, his blood being shed, so that our sins might be washed away. If you're not yet in the church, you need to make that decision. Make the decision to follow Jesus Christ. It'll better your life. It'll better your marriage. But it'll, most importantly, it's going to give you a hope of an eternity in heaven, something that no one else can offer but Jesus. If you're not in Him, put yourself into Him by believing, confessing, turning from your sins, being baptized in Jesus Christ so that He can add you to His church. If you're subject to invitation this morning, why don't you come while we stand, while we sing.